Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be talking about the registration journey of a Celeprin, uh, and so it is quite regulatory heavy, so I apologize for that. But I thought I'd kick off by talking about KCP 10.1.2, the effects on terrestrial vertebrates other than birds. Some worried faces, so yeah, I, don't worry, I am joking. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is David Piggott. I'm a regional technical manager for Turf and Landscape. Uh, so I work on the R&D side of the business. Um, my job really is trials and trial data, understanding new AIs, new products, how well they work in turf, gathering trial data, analyzing that trial data, and making recommendations on that trial data, pushing products towards registration, where I'll then generate more trial data to hopefully support that registration. So if you look at the timeline of products across the bottom, uh, you can see I'm working towards the left-hand side. Now, I thought I'd include this slide because at Syngenta, we absolutely love technical managers. I think uh, if I include Phil at the start here, we'd actually have four different technical managers talking to, to you today, uh, which can get slightly confusing. So hopefully this just explains the situation a little bit better. Uh, I work with regards to the testing. So as I mentioned, profiling, testing new concepts, new products. Uh, and work heavily with the registration side of things as well, uh, where I will work closely with Glenn, who we all know, uh, and sort of sure that handover process, uh, who will also work closely in turn with Sean when we come closer to being on the market and as we all know Sean's role. So Glenn and I are eARMY and this stands for Europe, Africa, and Middle East. So that's all the countries in that area, in that region. Uh, and when we get to Sean, he's working solely on the UK and Ireland. So. Hopefully that explains a little bit more about the different technical managers of Syngenta. Um, yeah, Celebrin, it's been a long journey. Uh, it's been a long and complicated journey. And what I want to do today is trying to share that journey with you um, and hope to just explain a little bit about why we are here today and how we got here. So I'm gonna take you all the way back to the year 2000, uh, the millennium bug and the diamide chemistry discovery. So the diamide chemistry is the class of chemicals where uh, chlorantranilaprol, which is the active substance in acelaprin, is found. So year 2000, we're basically discovering acelaprin. And that was a long time ago now, I hate to say it. 2008 was the first commercial launch of acelaprin anywhere in the world. And this happened in the US, in North America, uh, including on turf. In 2013, uh, the chlorine the active ingredient in acelaprin, was Annex 1 listed in the EU. So sorry for these regulatory terms. Basically, that just means that we can look to start making products with the active ingredient in it and sell them in the EU. In 2018, so five years ago now, we actually submitted a big dossier full of data to the UK uh, regulatory authority, which is CRD. So that was five years ago. In 2020, Syngenta had the first full acelaprin approvals in other countries, so France, for example. Uh, and whereas in the UK, we are here today in 2023, talking about a full approval. So what, what happened? Before I get onto that, I thought it might be better just to explain that time frame in a slightly different way. Uh, so. A celebrin was discovered around the same time as the Nokia 3210, or the Nokia 3310, so that long ago. Uh, here's one of Glenn's favorites. Uh, in 2008, when the first commercial launch of a celebrin happened in the US, this band were hitting up the charts. Does anyone know the name of this band? Does anyone else but Glenn know the name of this band? <laughs> the Ting Tings, yeah, thank you, yeah. That's not my name, by the way. <laughs> Uh, in 2013, this is very topical to today, uh, England actually managed to win and lose the Ashes in one year, which is quite special. If anyone does have any tickets, please let me know. Uh, in 2018 was the launch of the Dyson V10. We're now onto the V15, I think. So quite a long time ago. And of course, 2020, couldn't include 2020 without a three-ply face mask. So a long time, a really long time, a really long journey. And of course, that's not the full picture because we're actually just celebrating the full approval and the full registration this year in 2023. 
So I apologize for the very cheap gag here when I, I mentioned 1852. It probably feels like that long ago for the people involved in the emergency approvals. Uh, but we actually received our first emergency approval for a seller print in 2018. So the first year that we also submitted to CRD for full registration. And since then, we've had an emergency approval every year since. OK, so that includes 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. And we're here at the fuller seller print approval. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I would like to say a, a huge thank you to everyone involved in the emergency approvals within the room. They are absolutely fantastic. They really show a true need to control the pests that we do with chemistry. Uh, it's a real good opportunity for the industry to, to say, look, this pest is economically and culturally important. We need something to control it. And we have something to control it. But what's actually going on? Why are we taking five years to get to that fuller seller print approval. Well, I thought I'd put together a, a little bit here, uh, just sort of sharing some very light details about what's actually involved in that full registration. So apologies for the very obvious metaphor when I put, say, piecing together a registration, but I thought I'd put together a bit of a jigsaw piece to help show it. Broadly speaking, there's seven different criteria that we need to fulfill when we're trying to register a new product. And all of these different criteria interact with one another. They're all important to the other. And without one bit, we're not achieving that full registration. So I'll start with the biology, as we call it. Uh, and this is very much my role. I'm very much involved with this. Uh, that's also termed the efficacy. It's basically how well does the product work, OK? So the very obvious one about the product. We're looking for a registration. Does it actually work? Uh, so I will go out and conduct hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of field trials to show that, yes, it does work. And all of that data is compiled over several years, where we test the product across different seasons to <coughs> ensure good efficacy, in different climatic conditions to ensure good efficacy, and all of that will be put together. The second piece of the registration jigsaw is the chemistry, okay? And what does it look like to you guys in the room? Well, that's what's actually in the bottle. Does it conform to the safety standards, uh, but also, you know, if we store it for two years, for example, will it be as good as on the day that we purchased it? Uh, yes, we hope so. We have to prove it with trials and studies and also include that for submission. The third piece is mammalian toxicology. So some quite heavy words there. You know, is there a risk to our human health uh, inherently with using the product? Is it cancer causing? I hope not. We have to go out and prove that and include that in the submission, running all these trials, spending a lot of time and money on this. The fourth piece, termed here OPEX, uh, that stands for operator exposure. So that's whoever is spraying and applying the product. You know, is there any inherent risk to them? Hopefully not. Again, we have to go out and spend time and money on studies to prove this. It doesn't just apply to the operator, though. It's also applying to, say, the golfer. If we're playing golf, maybe the spectators in a, a stadium type arena. Again, all of this data needs to be included to support this registration. Consumer exposure, not so important for the turf industry. Hopefully we're not eating too much grass, but it plays a big part when we're talking about agricultural pesticide registration. When we talk about residues in food, etc. But again, we have to go and prove that this isn't an issue for our new turf insecticide. Environmental fate, I feel touched lightly on this. You know, what happens to the product when we spray it? Where does it end up? If we spray it uh, in, under certain conditions, on certain soil types, will it end up in the 18th pond by the green? And finally, the final jigsaw puzzle piece, ecotoxicology. And this is all about non-target organisms. We're spraying for leather jackets, chafer grubs, but what's the effect on the other organisms in the soil? What's the effect on birds and this type of thing? Um, so putting that all together, we have a celeprin, OK? Now, the important piece behind all of this is, is to understand that each of these pieces of the jigsaw are highly interlinked. So I can't, as the, the, the person responsible for the biology bit, say, OK, we want a US style approach. 15 litres per hectare applied 10 times through the year, for example. I mean, that's, that's obviously an exaggeration, but that would completely contradict and go against the other parts of the dossier. 
So we would never get that approved. So it's a real fine balancing act between all these different sections. I've just included them again here, sort of in more layman's terms. Uh, you know, the biology, does it work? Chemistry, is it made correctly? Mammalian toxicology, what's the, what's the risk to us? OPEX, what are the risks to golfers or, you know, uh, the general public? Consumer exposure, what happens if we eat it? Environmental fate, does the product end up in the nearest river? And ecotoxicology, eco is there a risk to fish, worms, etc.? everything that we're not applying it for? And all of that goes into one massive dossier, we call it, and we call that the biological assessment dossier. And that is not an artist's impression, that is actually a real life photo of a biological assessment dossier. Um, it's a huge amount of work, it's a huge amount of time, it's a huge amount of uh, money, of course, gone into all of these different individual studies to help support that approval. So when we go back to this previous slide, um, we're talking about obviously celebrating the full Acelloprin approval right now in 2023. What happened between 2018 and 2023? Uh, well, bear in mind, obviously, we submitted in 2018, so that whole massive dossier, that, that had to be generated before that. So we've been working on Acelloprin in the UK for close to 10 years now, uh, for the amount of work that's gone in before even submitting. Now, post-submission, what's actually happened is we enter a bit of a, a conversation type stage with CRD. Now, all of those different individual pieces of the jigsaw, they may have certain questions. They may say, okay, well, we wanna know a little bit more about the effect on columbula, for example, springtails, a really important part of the soil biology and soil health. Can you provide additional studies on that, for example? And bear in mind that that question might take a year to come back to us. We would then have to spend a year to generate that data and then a year to resubmit that data to help answer that question. It just becomes a very sort of long process when we have to start answering these questions and replying to your authorities. So hopefully that helps you explain. Um, and that's obviously just an example. They might pick up saying, OK, well, what about this storage study, for example? You know, are you sure you conducted that well? Have you got any more data for that? We will have to go out and spend some more time and resource to generate that data and then send it to them. So, yeah, hence a bit of a conversation between us and CRD. But obviously, absolutely thrilled that we now have the full Acelloprin approval. Um, so I've just included a couple of slides here talking about an integrated strategy. Hopefully, you know, that, that jigsaw puzzle uh, helps just explain, first of all, a bit about the label. And I mentioned it there, a application rate, for example, and number of applications. We, we, can't, we can't just go with whatever we want, whatever is best in terms of control for leather jackets and uh, chafer grubs. We have to consider all these other different aspects as well. And therefore, they all have to work together. All those pieces of the jigsaw have to work together. Uh, so our application rate of number of applications are limited. So we have 0.6 uh, litres per hectare and obviously one application per year. But that still shows, we've still done the biology work, I've still generated tons and tons of trial data to show that is still really, really good. And it is a huge investment to bring a new turf insecticide to market. Hopefully that's maybe one of the takeaways here, uh, the amount of work and time and, and effort to, to bring a new insecticide to the turf market. It is a very rare and unique opportunity. Um, it is a new insecticide launch in, in turf, which is going to be increasingly rare and increasingly unique, I would say. So please just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe consider that as well. It might be a long time before we're celebrating another insecticide launch in turf. It's certainly not common. And we really need to get the best out of the Celeprin and protect its registration. Uh, and now when I say protect its registration, uh, obviously alluding to, first of all, making sure we're compliant with the label so we, we don't end up with any, tons of it in, in groundwater, for example, and really making sure we're adhering to those statutory requirements, but also maybe considering uh, resistance management. The, the inherent resistance risk with the Celeprin is very, very low, but you know, with an integrated strategy, we're almost eliminating it, for example. Uh, and then also considering, and, and obviously, Glenn will talk to you all about this later, but an integrated approach, maybe with nematodes, you know, really does help bring out the best in the product and, and, and provide a total control situation. 
Um, so yeah, that is everything from me. Thank you very much for listening. If you do have any questions, please feel free to grab me or contact me uh, and I will pass on to Sean.